it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show. Our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. In addition to this podcast, you can find more money-saving advice on our websites, clark.com and clarkdeals.com. If you're not familiar with Clark Deals, it's where we post deals up to the minute, especially timely in the Christmas shopping season. Well, one of the biggest topics I've been asked about over the last year has been Series I savings bonds. And man, they confuse people. And people have some trouble from time to time buying them. But I want to tell you how the rates are set has just changed. Not just the rate, but how the rate will be set going forward. And I want to tell you how it works and how it works for you moving forward. I'm also going to talk about something that has freaked me out. What Americans are saving has collapsed, and not necessarily because of inflation. Some people, yes, but that's not the key. And this is tied right in with it. Big jump in the amount of credit card debt. And then, of course, I'm going to get to your questions. So I want to talk to you about the I-bonds. I-bonds became something that I have been at various phases since the 1990s obsessed with. And then I'm like, no big deal. I-bonds are inflation bonds where you take on the debt of the federal government. You're basically lending money to the federal government to deal with our ridiculously high budget deficit that we run in the United States. And then with an I-bond, you are rewarded by not falling behind inflation. And recently, there was a land rush buying them because the interest rate that I-bonds were paying was well over 9.5%. And so people were buying them like mad. At our uh, Team Clark Consumer Action Center, there were days that the number one question coming in day after day was about how to buy Series I savings bonds. And in short, in the simplest circumstance, although there are ways to go outside the caps, you can buy $10,000 of these each year. So they were paying the 9.64 or whatever it was exactly. They were paying these huge rates because the rate is reset every six months based on an inflation measurement index that the Federal Reserve uses, Treasury uses as well. And so the rate was crazy high the last six months. So now that you may not feel it yet, but inflation is not as bad as it's been, the new rate that resets every six months now is 6.89%. Still, much better than you can go earn anywhere else on savings. And you have to set up an account at savingsbonds.gov, and that'll take you to a website called Treasury Direct. It'll redirect you, and you're still at the right place. And you set up the account. They verify your identity. That's where a lot of people have tripped, where the systems had trouble verifying their identity. Verifies your identity, you get that. But there's a big difference. When I was on an all-out obsession with these 25 years ago, it was when Series I savings bonds were earning two rates. You were getting a base rate that at one time was 3%, if I remember right, plus the rate of inflation. So whatever inflation was, you were getting inflation plus an additional 3% on your money. For years, the Treasury has offered no return beyond the rate of inflation. So now with the new reset, people who buy Series I savings bonds now, or let's say you bought $10,000 worth at the 9.64%, you can't buy more till 23, not far away. If you buy more on those, yeah, you'll be earning over the next six months 6.89, nothing to sneeze at, but you'll also be earning an additional 0.4 of a percent. 
meaning that you'll always earn the rate of inflation plus an additional booster shot. So this is a great place during a time of even moderate to high inflation to have these. So the reason I didn't talk about Series I savings bonds for like 15 years is that interest rates were so low because inflation was so low on Series I bonds. And for those 15 years, the Federal Reserve was paying no money beyond the rate of inflation. So they were a terrible thing to own because they were earning a lot less than even a simple savings account or CD. So these are things when you buy them, you buy them under the rules when you buy them at that moment. You have to hold them a minimum of one year. It's best the way they're set up to hold them for five years. And every six months, the interest rate you earn resets. But the fact now that you will earn inflation plus another almost half a percent, 0.4 of 1%, makes these an even better deal than they were before. And until we get inflation squeezed out of the economy again, which will happen, I know during a time of inflation, it feels like it's never going to end. It's going to end, okay? It's a question of when it ends. Does, I mean, inflation will continue to decline in 23 unless we have a much bigger war breakout in Europe or we have a war that breaks out in Asia or something like that. Unless we have just something completely a bolt out of the blue, the inflationary cycle is trending down slower than any of us would like. But then there will come a time where I'll say, you know that stuff I talked about buying those Series I bonds? Don't buy them anymore. And if you bought them before and you were earning those great rates, now there's actually a good benefit to selling them and putting your money in something else. But for right now, and certainly for these six months, this cycle we're in, they remain a great place to park money. And when the calendar turns to January, if you did what I suggested and bought them in 22, you hit 23 again, you can buy more. And you can buy up to 10,000 for each family member. And yes, there are tricks of the trade that people keep posting of ways you can go past the 10 grand and they get a little esoteric. So I don't dwell on those. The most important thing is you know that this is better than having your money in a bank. It's better than having your money in a credit union. It's better than having it in an online bank. And so when am I ever going to say better, better, better? Still doesn't beat long-term investing. Krista? The first question I'm going to read is from Ken in California. Clark, my employer sent out our open enrollment info and is introducing something called personalized PTO. Starting January 1st, we no longer will accrue PTO. We will take as much time as we feel is reasonable, in quotes. Have you heard of this before? I can't believe this was done for our benefit, although it's <laughs> sold that way. My remaining 200 hours of PTO will go away and supposedly be held until I leave the company. This program seems like it'll be taken advantage of by some, and the hard workers will be taken advantage of. But I'd love your thoughts. Okay. So that sounds so cynical, what you said, Ken, and you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Employers are rolling out unlimited PTO because what it's turned out is that people who are really trying to advance in a career or people that are really, really hard workers never take their time off because they feel like, well, I, I don't have 15 days anymore, so... I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm not supposed to take any. And then, yes, there will be people who say, you know what? I always wanted to go to Kathmandu and go, you know, climb a mountain or something. And they'll disappear for three months and they're still getting a paycheck. So, yeah, it is a very odd thing with the unlimited PTO because for so many people, it ends up being. A straight jacket in their lives that they feel like they can never take a paid day off. So uh, you would think that I would think it was really cool that an employer says, hey, I trust you. Take as much time as you want because I don't like it because it has the opposite effect on a lot of workers 
that all work and no play makes you really dull. So whatever you historically have taken as vacation, if you're offered this unlimited PTO, feel comfortable taking the number of days that you were eligible before, before, and you took. And if you had never heard me say this, do I ever leave a vacation day on the table, Krista? Never. You've never seen me do that. I take my vacation. I think it's really important to have that balance in your life. Chris in Wisconsin says, I'm positioned for early retirement. My only concern is health care coverage. What are the best options out there for quality health care for early retirees? So, Chris, uh, this has two answers. From now through 25, as an individual buying health care, most people on healthcare.gov are going to find uh, more affordable options than you may have found prior to the last couple of years because there's now a much more enhanced federal subsidy that started during COVID on having people insured on an individual plan or a family plan. We are in open enrollment right now and you can go see the premiums and see if you do qualify for the special congressionally mandated subsidies that will be in effect for, I guess, a full five years based on the recent congressional extension. And so that has made what was cost prohibitive for so many people buying an individual or family policy on healthcare.gov for many people actually very affordable. Look at the silver plans. This is from Marianne in South Carolina. I looked up my homeowner's insurance company on the AM Best website and there was only an NR abbreviation for not reviewed, but it doesn't explain why there was no review. Could this be a red flag? So the story is, and this is true in a lot of insurance company cases, it is a subsidiary, wholly owned subsidiary of a larger insurance enterprise. And the parent company, Krista was kind enough to look up for me, is rated B double plus by AM Best which means that they are not uh, particularly strong financially, which if you were buying life insurance or an annuity, I, I cussed on the, on oh, the podcast. Gosh. Anyway, we'll bleep that if you were out. buying uh, either of those things, you want a company rated A plus or A plus plus to buy. When you're buying homeowners or auto, the you're buying for a shorter cycle it's almost like a term type of insurance that you're buying a year at a time or auto maybe six months at a time um, i'm not as worried about the financial solvency issue as i would be with something that's a long-term kind of play uh, but uh, the rating they have does not say that doesn't give a lot of confidence to their long-term financial strength so Coming up, I mentioned it earlier, it's kind of shocking what Americans are not saving right now. And the credit card debt that's piling on, it's a complete reversal of recent year patterns. And we got to have a talk. So, we as Americans historically save less of our pay than people in any other developed country. And not just a little less, a ton less. We are a culture that has been very much about today and very much about, I see it, I want it, that settles it. It's part of our mentality and immediate gratification. And it's just the way we're wired. But even in the bounds of that, what we're doing right now is almost like revenge spending. Because if you go back not that long ago in 20 and through the first half of 21, there were a lot of restrictions on Americans' movements, a lot imposed by ourselves on ourselves. We weren't doing a lot of the things we'd normally do. We weren't traveling. A lot of people weren't eating out. A lot of people weren't going to stores. And the shocker, if you've been listening to me long enough, you know that during peak COVID, 
we were saving money like maniacs in the United States. And the percent of our pay that we were saving was near record highs for the United States. Well, today, there was a lot of pent up frustration, a lot of um, upset, obviously, about the dislocation in people's lives, the loss of lives in the United States, everything that COVID did. I mean, a uh, pandemic, uh, fortunately, is the only one I've ever lived through. Hope it's the only one any of us ever get to live through is so disruptive emotionally, mentally, economically, every which way. And so there's no other term for what's been going on than extreme revenge spending. Now there are people, and it is a meaningful portion of the population in the United States that are stressed financially. And inflation has taken a hit to your wallet and you are having trouble meeting just life's normal obligations every month. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who are in a position to be able to save more, but they're not. The personal savings rate in the United States down to three cents on a dollar. That is pitiful. Uh, we actually have been worse. There was a time uh, right after the turn of the century where Americans were what were called negative net savers, meaning for every dollar people were making, they were spending a dollar one plus. I mean, that was unbelievable. Uh, just so you have frame of reference by comparison, in most developed countries, people save more than 20% of their pay, and in Asian developed countries, more than 30% of their pay. In the United States, we're saving 3% right now. And the other thing going on is credit card debt. We've gone bonkers with it. So during uh, COVID, people paid down credit card balances at unprecedented rates. The credit card companies were so upset, they didn't know what to do because they weren't making all that money on the credit card balances. Well, the balances in just the last 18 months are up more than 25% overall. I mean, we have been spending like crazy over the last year and a half. So the consequence, you think of these two things together. So we're getting to record levels of credit card debt in the United States. After we turn the clock way back during COVID and the amount of our money we're making that we're saving has shrunk to like nothing. And yes, I want to make it clear. There are two different groups here. There are people who are wheezing financially just dealing with life's basics. And then there's a larger group of Americans, I don't want to get into the stats, but it's significantly larger, that are people that discretionary spending is what's doing this, where the amount they're saving is going way down, the amount they're borrowing going way up. It, it's a bear trap. Because you get yourself into a position where anything goes wrong in your life, an unexpected uh, decline in the fortunes of who you work for, and suddenly out of nowhere you get laid off or they do pay cuts or whatever, whatever the circumstance, or you have uh, unexpected expense in your life and you don't have that cushion anymore. So if this is me trying to uh, nudge you, that's what I'm trying to do. Not trying to guilt you. And the whole thing is trying to get you to think that that credit card bill, I really don't like that credit card bill. Or where's my savings? What savings do I have if something happens? I want to reduce the anxiety in your life. And there's something I used to talk about in the Great Recession. It was the closet test. Go around your house or your apartment and look in every closet. If you have a house and you have an attic or if you have a basement in your house, something like that, go look at all the stuff there that you bought that you don't use and use that as like a truth serum for spending moving forward. Krista? 
All right. Well, speaking Did of... Did I do too much guilt there or was that the nudge I was I think looking you're trying at? to encourage people. Encourage? Okay. Because I don't want to be that person who's like piling on guilt. No, not at all. Well, uh, Phil actually, Phil in New Hampshire wrote in and says, why are credit card companies charging such high interest rates? My APR rate is over 20%. So credit card companies are doing two things at once right now. If you have a really solid credit score and you are a net payer, they're offering unbelievable rewards on reward cards trying to get the high volume chargers because of the money they make off of the merchant fees. And so if you are in that category, you're getting one offer after another with normally we give you 60,000 points, but right now we'll give you 100,000 points. And wait, there's more if you do this and blah, blah, blah. So they're giving all these rewards like candy to certain credit card issuer, uh, certain credit card users, and then others that are running balances, your back's already against the wall. They're boosting those rates, and credit card interest rates have just hit a record high level. So this is this is the pattern the card companies are using that they have. Uh, basically, two different type of profiles. There are others, but I'm generalizing here. People who are running balances are their prisoner, and they're going to just eat you up. And uh, the rates over 20%, that was unusual a year ago, not at all now. It's not because of inflation that the rates have gone up. And then you've got other people that are being subsidized by the people that are running the balances and paying interest. The whole key, Phil, is when you're in a position to never pay a credit card company another penny of interest again, your life going forward is going to feel so much better and you'll have so much more control. And I'd like to encourage Phil or anyone else to join our community on Clark.com or also on Facebook. We have a Ditch Your Debt group on our Facebook page um, where people help each other and encourage each other to pay down debts and share stories about that. I just did in my TV work a story on a gentleman in the military who had piled on a huge amount of credit card debt in just a two-year window. And he eventually got all of it paid off when he realized the consequences for his life and his future carrying all that debt. And uh, the march to zero dollars in credit card debt may be a long road, but when you complete that march, it feels great. Greg in California says, I just paid $16.64 for three small tacos at Chipotle. My son wrote in? (laughs) I was outraged when she told me the total, but I was hungry and paid it reluctantly. This is about double the cost of about a year ago. I see this type of increase often, mostly with prepared food service. It got me thinking that many businesses may be using the inflation, in quotes, news to artificially jack up their prices and make more money. What are your thoughts on this? What, can, as consumers, can we do? So, uh, Greg, my son, who's 17, is obsessed with Chipotle, and he eats there over and over and over again. And I went with him to sit with him while he was eating lunch there one day. And we get to the register, and they tell what the bill is. And he's so nonchalant about it because he's spending my money. (laughs) And I'm about to pass out how expensive it is. And Chipotle, like all other restaurants, has faced enormous labor pressure. And... They have raised pay rates to people to try to maintain a workforce. Uh, Some of the ingredients costs have gone up just as we experienced at the supermarket. But Chipotle has positioned itself a different place in the market. And it is priced as a premium dining casual option. And so you have to decide are those three small tacos good enough that it's worth spending the money? I wouldn't, but, and it sounds like you're not gonna. And if the marketplace responds 
with a decline in traffic and it starts to impact their profits and their revenue, they will suddenly start offering deals and specials. Tamara in North Carolina says, my company is offering me access to a non-qualified deferred compensation plan in addition to a 401k as a highly compensated employee. I understand there's some risk of losing the contributions if my company becomes insolvent. Would you take this risk? And do you know if you're taxed immediately on the lump sum upon separation from the company? Yeah, so Tamara, normally in a um, non-qualified plan, these are for key employees, usually higher compensation employees. When you go into the non-qualified, what non-qualified means is under the law that's also referred to as the Enron law, because of what happened when Enron went bust about a generation ago, if you're not familiar, it was, a, uh, it was an energy company based in Texas that there was a lot of cooking of the books. And the insiders ended up in the bankruptcy getting zillions of dollars. And the regular employees got wiped out. So this new law was passed that when a company goes insolvent, the people who are in a non-qualified plan for the higher compensated employees, they got wiped out when the company's assets get wiped out in a bankruptcy. So this is a tough bet because over the long haul, you have to be confident in the underlying financial strength of the enterprise you work for. Uh, since there is no backstop to your money like there would be in other forms of retirement plans. If you're truly, really confident, and if it's a publicly traded company, you can have a real sense of what levels of debt they carry, what levels of profitability they have. If you're truly comfortable with that, it's fine to go into a non-qualified deferred comp. The second part of this is how you're taxed. So as you take distributions from it, whether it's a multi-year payout, as the plan calls for, gives you the option of, or if it's a lump sum payout when you retire or no longer work at the organization, you are taxed in that year as if it was regular income, ordinary income, almost like a paycheck. So if you get paid out over, let's say, five years from the deferred comp, each year on your tax return, you'll have to report that income just as if it was paycheck income. So you have a big tax bill in each year. The advantage of a non-qualified deferred comp is usually an employer will be giving their higher end employees additional payments that you get in addition to what the deferred comp would earn on that money, making it a really valuable source of additional money later in your life. So there's a certain gamble on the financial strength of your employer, but beyond that, deferred comp plans are so popular with high-end employees and insiders because it is so lucrative. And uh, it is a situation where normal earthlings don't even have to worry about these questions. But if you have access to one, it really bears your time and energy to evaluate and see what it's got and if it would be good for you. And I want to tell you, I'm sorry if we didn't get to your questions today know that we do serve you 30 hours each week with one-on-one -on -one consumer advice available from the Team Clark Consumer Action Center. And if you call 636-492-5275, you can get that free, as we've been doing for 30 years, one-on-one -on -one advice, the hours available Monday through Friday, Eastern time zones, 10 in the morning, till four in the afternoon. Have a great day.